Hi there, I'm Jack. And this is Amy with Geary Electric, and this is video three in our Plant PAX series, Interlocks and Permissives. So we're going to begin, and this is using the program that we created in video number two. Our first step is to go offline from our controller and import the add-on instruction. So I'm going to navigate to the P interlock and P permissive blocks and bring them into my program. I'm going to skip through these steps, but if you need a refresher, you can go back to video number two, where we explain in detail how to import add-on instructions into the program. Once the add-on instructions are in our program, we can go back into our P-Motor instruction routine and begin adding our interlocks and permissives. Go ahead. All right, we're going to add the interlock to our existing Pump1 motor. Since I'm online to the controller, I'll have to enable online edits to begin making changes in the program. Okay, so we'll find the interlock block up here in our add-on toolbar. And I'll drag an instance onto our uh, drawing sheet here. And um, a couple of tasks that have to be done. One of the critical ones is being able to name this uh, tag, this, this uh, instance properly. All right. For the motor uh, block, which we called pump1, to recognize the interlock block, uh, this tag name is critical. The way it works is you start with the uh, tag name of the motor block, in our case pump1, underscore, uh, followed by, in this case, interlock, I-N-T-L-K. All right, and by using that naming convention, all right, uh, we have the ability for the motor block faceplate to be able to navigate automatically to the interlock faceplate. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing by bringing in the permissive block. Okay, there's a permissive block, an instance added uh, to our program here. Once again, exact same naming convention. It's going to be uh, pump1, in our case, underscore P-E-R-M for permissive. And once again, by doing that, the uh, motor faceplate will automatically recognize the fact that that uh, permissive block is wired to it. So the next task is simply wire them up. The interlock is wired to a, uh, a point in the motor block that's already been pre-configured to accept that, all right, should it exist, and likely for, for the permissives. So you can see the appropriate uh, locations that we need to wire them to. All right, uh, the next thing we need to do is we need to be able to wire the status condition of our motor back into the interlock and permissive blocks, respectively. So we need to wire the status bypass active of the motor block, wire that to the input of the permissives and the interlocks. And once again, there's a connection point that allows us to do that. Now all we need to do is add some inputs for our permissives and interlocks. The interlock will call pressure for a tag name, and the permissives we can call pump2. All right, and that's it. So I'm going to finalize the edits, throw them in there. Oh no, Jack, what happened? <laughs> okay, didn't do anything wrong here. Uh, it did not verify, and the reason is because we have a circular reference. We're wiring an output back to an input, all right? So we got to assume that data is available, and we do that by right-clicking on the wires and checking off assume data available for each of the wires. All right, so now that's all running, we can head over to our Factory Talk View SE station that we pre-configured in the last video and start programming the interlock. So to be able to use the permissive and interlock faceplates, you just need to be able to enable the functions to them. And that's done from the Engineering tab, and there's checkboxes there that allows us to tell the motor block that those things exist. I'm just playing around here on the engineering tab so you can see you have the option to enable or disable navigation to the interlock permissive or both. We'll click on the interlock and that'll bring up the interlock faceplate. What you see here will be configured by you according to the number of interlocks that you have along with their descriptions. Once again that's done from the engineering tab and uh, we can 
go in and put in descriptions. If you go to the subsequent tabs there, there's our descriptions. So we can choose what to put in those boxes. We'll just go back and verify we put in the program. It was pressure. So I'm going to type pressure in this field and hit the enter key. All right. Notice there's a, a couple of configuration options. Uh, is this interlock bypassable? For example, when I uh, log into maintenance mode, will maintenance be able to bypass this interlock or not? Another uh, configuration parameter is, um, is the OK state, right? Is a 0 an OK state or is a 1 an OK state? So that's configurable as well. And the third thing is resets. Should an interlock uh, trip occur, uh, do you want an automatic or actually a manual reset? What it says must reset, if that's checked off, that means that the operator needs to click in to the uh, motor block and actually physically reset the device before you're able to uh, start the motor again. So we can see here pressure is OK because when we were on here the OK state is low. Is correct. If we were to change this to the OK state is high, when we go back to our home screen we'll see there's a problem with pressure. Correct. Because our pressure state in our PLC is off right now. So if we were to toggle this bit I'm just going to change this to high so that we can see here. Now pressure is OK because we've set this up for the OK state is high. Now what's interesting is there's a very, very useful feature here that's not readily apparent. Uh, partly it's not why it's not apparent is because we only have one interlock. But the interlock has a capability of doing what's called first out detection. So in other words, when we have a fault, quite often several interlocks trip but you don't know which one is the, is the root cause for the problem. So uh, what this instruction will do for us is able to detect which one will trip first out of multiple trips and it'll be highlighted in yellow. So let's give this a try and see what it looks like in both our program and our HMI application. So we're going to head back into the program and we're going to add some more conditions on this interlock. So I'm going to flip back over to my PLC and add input conditions for level and temperature on the input instruction. When those changes are live in my PLC, I can head back to the engineering tab in the interlock window and label those conditions within my block. I'm going to check off some boxes here for must reset and can bypass so we can see how these react after the alarms have been tripped within my system. So we can see back here on the home tab that my input conditions are pressure, level, and temperature, and they're all in the OK state. As well, the last time there was an error on this system, it was pressure that had been the first one to trip. So let's go on back to our program and change the state of one of our conditions and see how the interlock reacts. So I'm going to go ahead and toggle the states for level and temp, and then we'll head back to the HMI and see how the system responds. You can see here from the interlock faceplate, it shows that level was the first condition to trip on this interlock. Cool, eh? Yeah. That's a cool feature. So before this motor can be started, we have to reset the level input condition. And that's because here on the engineering tab, I had clicked must reset for the level input condition. Our interlock block shows us what, why the motor can't run. Uh, level needs to be reset. There's a reset uh, command required for that. And we still have a temperature. Uh, as an interlock that's tripped, but it can be bypassed. So we can go to the motor faceplate and uh, be able to enter maintenance mode in order to bypass that trip to allow the motor to start. Okay, we are clicking on maintenance mode and we enter maintenance mode and the uh, interlock is bypassed, allowing us to start the motor. So I can get out of maintenance mode by clicking on this closed toolbox right here and I'm going to head back into my PLC and change the state of temps so that the interlock is allowing the motor to run. So you'll see when we head back over, the interlock is green and is no longer preventing the motor from running. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're going to close the interlock and open permissive. One of the neat things about this Plant PAX system is the ability to have multiple faceplates open at the same time. And you can see here I can stack the interlock and permissive side by side on my screen. So we're going to do the same thing here on the engineering screen with the configuration. And what did we call the permissive? It was pump 2. Pump 2. So I'm going to rename this pump 2 in this field. I'm just going to put these two face plates side by side so you can see that it's a consistent look across all the engineering tabs on these face plates. 
So we're going to configure the permissives for our pump one. What you'll see me do here is add another P motor instruction, and we're going to use that as the permissive for our pump one. This means that our pump one will not be allowed to run until the pump feeding it is also running. So I'm going to head back into Factory Talk View Studio, and I'm going to open our main screen and add that new motor in. So as shown in the previous video, I'm going to open up my global objects, bring in the new motor, and set the parameter values so that this is linked to the instruction that I just brought into my program. So I'm going to head back to my HMI and click on Refresh. Right. Now we can call up the base plates for pump 1 and for pump 2. You can see there is pump 1. It needs the permissive of pump 2 to be running before we can start this one. So we call up a pump 2 faceplate. We start the pump. And you can see now the permissive has been made. So now we can start pump 1. And now pump 1 is running. So that's it for our interlocks and permissive video. This was Amy. And this is Jack. With Geary Electric.